Revelation chapter 1 and verse 4. Now, when we write letters, we generally sign the letter at the, at the bottom of it. Uh, you may have at times to turn a letter over to see from whom it is. But, of course, imagine how um, difficult that would be on a scroll, to have to unroll a whole scroll to get to the end to find out from whom it has come. So it, when it comes to scrolls, names were put somewhere near the beginning so that as you read the rest of the letter or whatever it was, you knew from whom it had come. So you'll notice that is exactly what the writer does here in verse 4. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace be unto you and peace from him which is and which was and which is to come and from the seven spirits which are before his throne and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth. Unto him that loved us and washed us or loosed us from our sins in his own blood and hath made us kings and priests unto God and his father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he cometh with clouds and every eye shall see him. Somebody has said that um, inspired by God, John put the end at the beginning, as though it was too good a thing to wait until you get to what we call chapter 20, chapter 19 and 20 and 21. And so now he tells us what's going to happen at the end. Behold, he cometh with clouds, and every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall wail because of him even so. Amen. Now another reading, please, in chapter 5. <clears throat> Revelation chapter 5. And verse 8, and when he, that is the lamb, the Lord Jesus, when he had taken the book, the four beasts and four and twenty elders fell down before the lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood, out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And just one more reading, please, in chapter 7. Now John has seen a vast throng of men and women surrounding the throne of God, all of them saved, and the question is asked in verse 13, one of the elders answered, saying unto me, What are these which are arrayed in white robes? And whence came they? And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. And he said to me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Therefore, this is the reason why, therefore are they before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more, neither shall the sun light on them nor any heat. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of waters, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. God willing, if the Lord Jesus has not come, tomorrow night we're going to be looking at what is often called the rapture. And that will be the start of looking at some topics that are very difficult and they are wide ranging in what they teach us. But tonight is all about salvation, all about how you can get to heaven and how you can be sure of it. I'm hoping that there are people here who are thinking about salvation and would like to have it. And very often in a meeting, there are people who are uncertain whether they have it and would like to be sure. If there's anybody like that, then this is the meeting for you. In a very simple way, I want you to look at these glimpses we have in the book of Revelation and the explanations that are given to us about salvation. Notice, please, in chapter 1, we have John's exclamation, unto him that loved us and loosed us from our sins in his own blood. So I want you to think about the topic of emancipation, of being set free, because that's the literal meaning of the word, unto him that loved us and loosed us from our sins in his own blood. Would you notice 
please, that he talks about the Savior's love? Not his love. He talks about the love of Christ. Because you see, when it comes to salvation, it's not a matter of whether you can get to love God or how you feel tonight. John is telling us about the Savior's love for us, for guilty sinners. And so he says, unto him that loved us. Because it's not our love for him, but his love for you that led him to go to Calvary. John is the one who recorded, here in his love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the payment for our sin. John is the one who recorded about Christ, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. And John is the one who recorded, we love him because he first loved us. So yes, it is true. People who are saved love the Lord Jesus, but only because he first loved us. Paul wrote, Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. When it comes to salvation, please hear me. If you're a teenager or a young boy or girl, please listen for a moment. When it comes to salvation, God never directs you to look into your heart to see how you feel. God directs you to look into his word to see what Christ has done for you. About 15 minutes drive from where I live, there is a shopping mall in a place called Deptford, New Jersey. And this month, in 1999, there were some uh, Brooks security men who were coming out of a store or a bank with um, containers of money. And all of a sudden, there are two robbers, two thieves, who pull out guns. Now, you, you know how malls are. You know there's a center part and there's, there's a long corridor generally. And then there are um, uh, lanes off of there that lead to exits. So in one of those sections leading out to an exit, all of a sudden, a gunfire breaks out. On a January day, the middle of the day, with shoppers all around. And coming around the corner was a woman named Kathy, 19-year-old girl, with her brother, Nicholas. And as they walk around the corner, bullets are flying. Nicholas pushed his sister to the floor, threw his body over her, and died. The bullets hit him, but his body shielded Kathy. Kathy said this sometime later, my brother loved me enough to push me out of the way and to take that bullet that killed him. It would have hit her, but it hit him instead. My brother loved me enough to do that. My Savior loved me enough to go to a cross, loved me enough to take my sins on himself, loved me enough to endure God's wrath and judgment against those sins. And as the poet wrote, nobody ever loved like that. John says, unto him that loved us. And then he speaks about the liberation, the loosing of, of the sinner, and loosed us from our sins in his own blood. You see, men and women are slaves to sin. The Lord Jesus said, whoever commits sin is a slave to sin. As a young teenage boy, I imagined that I was in control of my life. I was making the choices. I was doing what I wanted to do. Sometimes I would do it behind my parents' back. I was doing what I wanted to do. And all the time, on that broad road, I was being pushed down that road to eternal destruction in hell. I was being ruled over by a cruel overlord called Satan, and I was marching according to what he was telling me to do. There was a response in my heart because I was a sinner. But I was trapped by my sins. I was caught by my sins. Again, the Savior said, whoever commits sin is the slave of sin. And our world is filled with men and women who are slaves to sin, slaves to religious systems, slaves to habits they cannot break, slaves to that awful God of this age, the devil. And John says to him that loved us and set us free, loosed us from our sins, in his own blood. Unto him, he says, be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Do you know what that is? That's the language of saved people. 
That's the language of saved people. Because there's only saved people that give all the credit to Christ. You ask somebody who doesn't, hasn't been born again. Ask, ask, ask that, let's say a man. Ask him uh, whether he's going to hell. And listen to what he'll tell you. He'll tell you all that he didn't do. Oh, my. Hell, no, I mean, I never robbed a bank. I never, I never killed anybody. I never, never committed any immorality. No, no. Ask him whether he hopes to be in heaven and listen to him tell you all that he has done. Well, I certainly hope I'll be in heaven. I mean, I, I, I try to do the best I can. God knows we all make mistakes, but I try to do the best I can. I try to keep the Ten Commandments. I, 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 I'm good to my neighbors. I pay my debts. Ask a person who is saved whether he's going to hell or to heaven. And he'll tell you, I deserve to go to hell, but I'm going to heaven because Jesus died for me. That's exactly what John is saying here. He gets all the glory unto him that loved us, unto him. See, he's not just making a statement, he loved us. He's saying, to him that loved us and loosed us from our sins, to him be the glory. Has there ever been a moment where you were set free from your sins? I have a friend who's now in heaven. A wonderful old man. Uh, he was in the Second World War. He was old when I knew him. <laughs> he was in the Second World War. And uh, if you've ever seen that famous picture of uh, East meeting West, I think it was the Elbe River, and um, Allied troops had been kind of told to slow down to let the Russians catch up. And then there was this famous meeting over the Elbe River. But actually, the first Allies crossing the Elbe River were my friend and his associates because they were in communications and they were told to cross the river to the other side and to set things up so that when that meeting takes place and when East and West met, that the lines of communication would be up and would be functioning. So he was over there. His army was on this side. He's across the river over here. And the Russian army was plundering the neighborhood. I want to be very careful now how I say what's about to happen. But he's working here, and all of a sudden, her clothes disheveled, look of terror on her face. A woman comes darting out of the woods, and she spots him, and she runs to him. His name was Walter. And in broken English, she says, Help, please, help. Russians, help. He was from down south, so he spoke with a drawl, and he said, um, the only way I can help you is if you surrender to me. Surrender, yes, surrender, surrender. All right. Within seconds, three Russian soldiers appeared at the tree line, and then when they spotted her, they ran, and they said to Walter, good, you've got her. Yes, good, good, she with us. Property of the U.S. Army. <laughs> She surrendered to me. Oh, and they ran off. How was she set free? She surrendered to him. How was I set free? On a July night in 1966, when I was at the end of my rope, nothing had worked. I was so thoroughly, totally confused and lost, I gave up. And I just simply took God at his word that Jesus had died for me. And the moment I did that, God saved me. He set me free. So John is telling us in this wonderful exclamation to him that loved us and loosed us from our sins in his own blood. Now, if you catch on, you will begin to notice that in the next two passages we're going to look at, there is a remarkable similarity because there really is only one way to be saved. It's through Christ. So when you come now to chapter 5 and we're allowed to hear heaven's exaltation and its praise and worship of the Lord Jesus, we're now looking at the biblical word redemption. Unto him that loved us, John says, and loosed us, that's emancipation, come to chapter 5, and they're saying, thou art worthy, thou wast slain, thou hast redeemed us to God by thy blood. Now let me quickly give you the background. Actually, that is something we may look at later in the meetings, but it has to do with this icon just here, the little lamb as the Lord Jesus has described, and this scroll with seven seals on it. And basically, those, that scroll is the title deed to planet Earth. 
That scroll is God's program to recover the planet. And in chapter 5, John sees that there's no one in heaven, no one on earth, no one under the earth that is able to go up to God on his throne and take that book and open it. And you know what happens? John starts to cry. And, and, and we're, we're suddenly presented with a weeping prophet, a weeping seer, as he realizes that he and you and me and every other human being belong to a disqualified race. There's nothing we can do to save ourselves. And John puts it very eloquently, no one in heaven, no one on earth, no one under the earth. It was impossible for us to save ourselves. It was impossible for someone else to save you. You see, in order for you to be saved, let me tell you the two requirements. This was going to require someone who had no sin of his own and someone who was of such infinite value that he could die for the entire race. There's none of us that meet that. Every one of us is a sinner. Every one of us is a finite being. So none of us could save ourselves, let alone save somebody else. Now, God has given us some wonderful illustrations of that. I'm, I'm, I'm working really hard to make sure I let you out early tonight. I'm thankful you're here, and I want to make sure you have plenty of time to get home safely. But God has given us some wonderful illustrations of this. For instance, there was a man named Judah who had been guilty of selling his brother into slavery. And years later, when they're uh, standing before their brother and they don't recognize him, Joseph takes their brother Benjamin and says, well, I'm going to hold on to Benjamin. I'm going to put him in prison here until you come back with your father. And Judah offers himself. Judah says, no, no, let him go. It'll kill dad if he doesn't go home. Let him go. Take me instead. But how could Judah be a substitute? Judah was guilty. Benjamin wasn't even involved in it, so Benjamin was innocent. How can a guilty person take the place of somebody else? Judah had his own sins, so that wouldn't work. Now come to the next book, and there's a man named Moses. And Moses has seen what the Israelites have done with their idol worship. And he goes up into the mountain, and he says to God, if somebody has to die for that, let me die instead of the nation. But how can Moses die for millions of people? He picked one man. He Finite. So Judah was disqualified because he was guilty. Moses is disqualified because he's just a normal human being. You need a savior who is both sinless and infinite. And there's only one person, just one person meets that criteria. And John sees him. That's why he's weeping, because there's, he doesn't find anybody. He doesn't know anybody that can do this. I, I had the privilege of having meetings with a, a wonderful missionary. Uh, he was from Ireland, and he labored in South Africa. His name was Mr. Robert Neal. And uh, he didn't like to tell uh, anecdotes when he was preaching. But he knew I did, <laughs> so he was kind enough to tell me an experience he had. He said, we were building a new gospel hall. And he said, I hired a man to lay the blocks for the foundation. And he said, I sort of got a little frightened when I found out that he didn't know how to use a level. So I started to explain to him, now look, you see this little window here? And you see that, that, that bubble? Now, now when, you, when you put that against the wall, that bubble has to be right between those two lines or, or the wall is not plumb. And, and when you put a course around lay it this way and, and see this window? Now that bubble has to be right between those two lines or it's not even. Yes, the man said he, he understood. Mr. Neal was a little worried, so he went to the job site uh, in the morning and as he's, he parked the car and got out and he's walking, he hears banging going on down in the hole. Now, this man is laying block. There's nothing to bang. Uh, it, he, he, he looks into the hole, and here's the man. He has taken the level. He's holding it like a baseball bat, and he is wailing away at the side of the blocks that he's laid and hitting it. And Mr. Neal jumped down and said, stop, stop. You're gonna, what are you doing? You're going to break it. What are you doing? And he said, I did what you said. 
He said, I, 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 I put it against it. And he said, it's, it's, it's out. So he says, I'm trying to get it back where it should be. No, no, Mr. Neal said, you can use the level to show you that it's not right. But you can't use the level to fix it. You can use the law of God, the Ten Commandments, to show you that you're not right with God. But you can't take those Ten Commandments to make yourself right. You're disqualified. And then John has said, don't cry. The Lion of the Tribe of Judah. I think it's remarkable that, that they, these titles should all merge here. The Lion of the Tribe of Judah has prevailed. He can open this, the book. He can break the seals. And John turns and he sees a lamb, the divine redeemer, the worthy savior, the one who has the right of creation, the one who has the right because of Calvary, the one who has the right in a coming day because of conquest. And here is this one. He takes that scroll and the rest of the book of Revelation, much of it is going to be occupied with what happens when he breaks the seven seals that are on that scroll and unrolls it. And that triggers this distinctive refrain that is so similar to chapter one, as you have now worshiping saints saying, thou art worthy, thou art worthy to Christ. Thou was slain, thou hast redeemed us to God by thy blood. There's no mention of religion. There's no mention of charity. There's no mention of faith. There's no mention of works. There's no mention of baptism. I say again, it is a distinctive mark of people who are saved that they give Christ all the glory. Look what happens when you come to chapter 7. Chapter 7, we have this elder's explanation of how these people reached God and the throne. And I suppose if we're looking for a word, the word would be purgation, the cleansing, the washing away of sin. Because the elder says to him, they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. John sees a vast throng of people I think maybe there's some value just to looking at, at this in j just a bit of detail right now, just to set the scene for you. If the Lord Jesus came tonight, this open door would be closed for you. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 makes it clear that when a person rejects the gospel, there is no second chance after the Lord comes. If he does not come and we have a meeting tomorrow night, I hope you will come to understand how serious this all is. That the moment he comes, not only will Christians go, but so will your opportunity to be saved. But afterward, there are going to be men preaching the gospel. It's going to start with two men that God's going to raise up. And they're going to perform miracles. And there are going to be a number of Jewish people watching this and studying the scriptures and trying to put together what has happened and what, what does this mean. And those two men are going to be killed. If you look at the chart, you'll see that there is this sinister figure here. The term Antichrist is used there simply because most people call him that. He is going to kill those two men. And the Jewish people at that point, these there'll be 144,000 of them are going to be saved. People who did not reject the gospel before, they're going to be saved and they are going to be the gospel preachers of this period of time, the Great Tribulation. It will be like a having 144,000 Apostle Pauls let loose on the world. I speak English, do the best I can, I know a smattering of Italian. I had French for four years in high school and can hardly remember much of that. These, these men, th th please, don't, don't think about 144,000 Jews all living in Jerusalem. These are going to be from all over the world. They're going to speak not merely the language, but the dialect of the countries in which they were brought up. Imagine them preaching. And, and for all the years that they preached, the three and a half years that they will be preaching, this awful beast, under that crown, he will be unable to put a hand on one of them. And there will be millions of people saved through their preaching. It may be that there will be more people saved in that three and a half year period of time 
than has been saved in all of the 2,000 years since the resurrection of Christ. There will be a vast number of people who will be saved. They will preach the same gospel message that you're listening to when you come to the gospel hall with this one difference. We're telling you, you need to be saved before the Lord comes back for his church. They're going to be preaching that you need to be saved, not you, because it will be impossible, that people need to be saved before the king comes back for his crown, for his throne. And so as they preach, John now sees this vast throng around the the throne of God and of the Lamb, and they are there because their sins were washed away in the blood of Christ. So I want to close by just pointing out to you some of what people are going to do in heaven forever and some of the things that they don't do. This is what I've been able to find out. It's probably an incomplete list, but looking through the book of Revelation, I find in chapter 5, say people are going to worship. In chapter 6, at least up until when it happens, they'll be longing for his kingdom to come, for justice to come to this world. Chapter 11, They will give thanks. Chapter 14, they will rest. Their labors are over. Chapter 19, as in Luke chapter 15, they will rejoice. People say, um, do people in heaven know what's happening on earth? Well, people in heaven really aren't interested in who wins an election, who wins a ball game. But Luke chapter 15, I hear about people in heaven rejoicing. Luke chapter 19, there's people in heaven that are rejoicing about what's happening on earth. So I am left to infer, please correct me if you feel I'm going too far, I'm left to infer that heaven rejoices over anything that happens in this world that brings honor to the Lord Jesus. The salvation of a soul, the advancement of his kingdom, heaven is rejoicing. You will find in chapter 19 that they are observing things related to his kingdom, his glory, and his purposes And in chapter 22, they're serving. Let me give you a quick list of things that they don't do in heaven. They don't suffer. They don't sorrow. They don't sin. They don't sicken. They don't say goodbye. They don't age. They don't die. And if you could step into heaven tonight and tap somebody on the shoulder, wouldn't matter who you picked, And ask that person, how did you get here? It would not matter whom you selected. It would not matter which person you chose. Revelation chapter 1, chapter 5, chapter 7, tell me, they'll all tell you the same thing. How did I get here? Him. (laughs) Him. And they point you to the Lamb of God. In November 1944, A very evil man, Adolf Eichmann, organized a death march of more than 70,000 Jews to the Austrian border. The key in what I'm about to tell you is that the people overseeing that death march were not Nazis in the sense of being German soldiers, but they were Hungarian gendarmes, policemen. And there was a man who followed that tragic train of people called Raoul Wallenberg. And he had in his pocket basically get out of jail free passes for 100 people. Now, I, I'm going to, instead of my words, I'm going to give you the words of a survivor. These were all basically women. Here's the words of a survivor The conditions were frightful. We walked 30 to 40 kilometers a day in freezing rain, driven all the time by the Hungarian gendarmes. We were all women and girls. I was 17 at the time. The gendarmes were brutal, beating those who could not keep up, leaving others to die in the ditches. Suddenly, I heard a great commotion among the women. It's Wallenberg. It's Wallenberg, they said. I didn't think he could really help me. In any way, I was too weak now to move. So I lay there on the floor as dozens of women clustered around him crying, save us, save us. I remember being struck. Now you must understand what they looked like. 
how bedraggled and, and unkempt and, and their clothes torn, their hairs matted and dirty, traveling like this through, through sleet and rain and, and, and nowhere to stop or to wash. She said, I remember being struck by how he looked, how clean, in his leather coat and fur hat, like a, like a being from another world. And I thought, why does he bother with such wretched creatures as we? Got that? Why does he bother with such wretched creatures as we? As the women clustered around him, he said to them, please, you must forgive me. I cannot help all of you. I can only provide certificates for a hundred of you. Then he said something that really surprised me. He said, I feel I have a mission to save the Jewish nation, and so I must rescue the young ones first. He looked around the room, and he began putting names down on a list. And when he saw me lying on the floor, he came over to me. He said, what is your name? And he added the name of that 17-year-old girl to his list. You know, I've, I've often thought of that, thought of her words. Why would he have any concern for wretched creatures like us? And I've thought, why would he have any concern, any compassion, let alone love, for wretched, ruined creatures. We were not merely broken by sin. We had rebelled. It's not a matter just we needed to be fixed. Our very hearts were against him. And he came to where we were. And he went to a cross to die to save you. And I hope with all, I hope with all my heart that you will trust him tonight and rest your soul for eternity on the work that Christ has done, on the Savior who died and rose again, and go home this wonderful January night in your life. Go home for the first time, sure, certain, that you will be in heaven forever. Shall we pray? Our Father, we thank Thee for bringing us here safely and for the time we've had to consider Thy word. We ask for thy blessing on what we have read, what we have discussed, and we pray for the salvation of a precious soul tonight. Grant us all safety, Lord, on the roads as we make our way home. We give our thanks in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.